we're going to, good afternoon, we're going to go ahead and get started. Yeah. This speaker, he is the commander, founder, and director of operations of the Detroit Threat Management Center, Mr. Dale Brown. Thank you. Uh, what I have is a short video uh, that we play as an intro that uh, a company made, in, a production company made in Hollywood. This is what they think we do. <laughs> there have been at least six murders in the past 48 hours in Detroit. This video now of men shooting a bouncer outside of a strip club in Detroit. Crime hits hard. A rash of murders has Detroit police and residents on alert today. He said the budget is not going to allow for more police, so police need the community to help to continue the overall decrease in crime. One company. It's back. Harder. Tired of waiting for police and sick of crime, some frustrated local homeowners and businesses are turning to a new kind of security. All eyes on crime. Their movement is captured on cameras and recorded on computers at the control center. Within minutes, this intruder has company. Missions. The father, who is a drug dealer from Yemen, currently at the home. Our objective is to reunite the two-year-old daughter with the mother who was taken from Arizona against the mother's will. Video. Can we turn the lights back on, please? All right, so people think of our organization as uh, uh, private policing. Uh, they often think of us as uh, uh, high, uh, high performance and uh, kind of gung-ho, paramilitary uniforms. And really what we are are people that create peaceful outcomes. And the way we do that is by understanding psychology, the direct correlation between law, both civil and criminal, and the skills to support that outcome. So essentially what threat management is, is the way of thinking, the methodology that allows us to create the peace we all want. Whether it's commercial or corporate or, or communities, everyone wants the same thing, which is a non-violent uh, outcome, a non-violent existence. And this is how to do that. And so for the past 20 years, I started in 1994, helping families in the east side of Detroit. Uh, what I first did was I started teaching in the parks in Detroit how to defend yourself, how teaching families, teaching people. And the reason I did and the reason I wanted to was because initially I just wanted to teach a modern martial art uh, from America. So I studied all different martial arts. I learned Japanese, I learned Korean, I learned all these Chinese different things from different systems. And I thought, why don't we have our own system right here in America, from America, that deals with what we have to deal with. We have guns, pistols, shotgun, rifle, knives. We have to learn how to fight with our clothes on, standing up. We don't have, um, I live in Michigan, so we don't have like our shoes off normally. Um, there's no special karate geese that are gonna be appropriate. So if we had a situation, we would have our clothes on and our, and our boots on. So we need to have a martial art that takes it into account. And my point was, why not learn something that can actually help you defend yourself? Why do I want to be a great martial arts sports fighter? I don't. Um, and why isn't there a system to support that? And if we're in real life, why is there not a school that teaches you what happens legally as you touch people? I mean, this is real. And, and remember the Karate Kid movie where uh, Mr. Miyagi battled the teenagers? Okay, that guy would be going to jail for beating up children. Those are felonies. Every time he beat up a kid uh, who went to beat up the karate kid, that would make him a felon. Okay, those are individual felonies. 
Uh, he was allowed to go on to several other movies, but in real life, he would have been arrested. <laughs> so we have to train for real life. And that was my point was, there is no real life training. And in our real world in America, we have pistols, shotguns, rifles, and no martial arts even really want to deal with that. Uh, so I wanted to create a school just for that reason. And so my school, when I first started in the early 90s, uh, centered on my understanding as a private investigator, uh, laws that we have to not cross as civilians while we're out protecting ourselves and others, and then the martial arts that correspond with that, um, and the skills, so civil and criminal law. And then uh, when I went to Detroit, I found people that really could benefit by this knowledge. In one situation, and one of the, 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 the story that really brought it home for me was, a young lady was uh, on a bridge. Uh, there's an island in Detroit, it's called Belle Isle. It's the biggest island connected to any city in America. Six mile island, six miles around. Uh, so this big long bridge, about a mile long, a woman was chased off of this bridge in broad daylight with a crowd of people uh, that were cheering, is what the news said. And uh, CNN put it in high rotation. Uh, they were like, oh, Detroit is so terrible. Look, they, were kid they chased a woman off the bridge in front of her child, and uh, it was a horrible story. It turns out it was worse than that. It was worse than what I thought it was. Um, the crowd of people were, ki were, were chanting, you know, kill her, kill her. It was fun, apparently, the thought process was. And this is what happens in groups. Groups, group, Human uh, groups do this to uh, smaller victims. Uh, they cheer the, um, the destruction of the human. And uh, the two heroes that did come out of the crowd and jumped off this bridge to save this woman, essentially uh, guys in broad daylight took crowbars and started crowbarring her door open to attack this woman in front of her daughter and attack her, maybe her daughter too. Um, they stripped her clothes off of her in broad daylight. She then jumped off of a bridge to escape. And um, the guy had a crowbar and said, you know, either jump off the bridge or I'm going to hit you. And this is in front of the crowd. And uh, it's a really big guy. He was going to go to University of Michigan. The uh, big guy went to a private school. He had two parents. They were professionals. And uh, he, he literally was going to University of Michigan on a full ride football scholarship uh, the, the next year. And. Uh, the woman jumped off the bridge and she died in the water, but two men jumped off the bridge to rescue her. And they, uh, they, swim, they swam, but they couldn't save her. Um, and long story short, she, those guys were actually, those two heroes, were actually arrested uh, for some kind of weed charge or something they had right on the air. So it was live, and when they were getting their reward for, for trying to save the woman, they were both taken into custody uh, right alive on the air. And that happens across this country in many different urban environments. And in Detroit, I had no idea. I really thought the people there are the problem. And the reality was, I, as I learned, that the government, uh, which we think of as the people that are supposed to be providing the service of safety, are providing a, uh, an actual function that is called law enforcement. Um, and that's the basics of it. That's law enforcement means that laws have been broken, then they go enforce those laws, uh, as they see fit uh, based on them being broken, which has very little to do with you not getting raped, robbed, or killed. And if you don't want to be raped, robbed, or killed, that has nothing, that's not really related to that. Uh, and so I didn't know this, but there, there's such a thing as pre-crime prevention policing, not really. And if it did, it would have a metrics, right? So they would say, in Ohio, in this state or in this city, this is what happened in our prevention model, that we had this many crimes prevented. They didn't, there's no such thing as that. There's no metrics for prevention because that's not what law enforcement is about. Law enforcement is about prosecution on its best day of those that they would like to select for prosecution. And the, my point in saying that is this, that if we want safety, and safety is the foundation of success for everyone and everything, if we want that, then we have to not think about enforcing laws, whether it's privately or uh, governmentally. We cannot think, how will I privately police this community? We have to think, how will I create conditions where police are not necessary because no crimes are committed? That requires threat management. And threat management can, can be provided best by the people that live in the community, uh, not by people who visit, but it could be. You can help people in different areas temporarily uh, or long-term if there's a setup for that. But generally, the best way to do it is people protecting themselves through a system that means they can do this safely without making wrong decisions. So for example, if someone walked up to you at your home and they mean well, and they have their gun or they have a knife or a stick and they want to see if you're you, you might be offended and you might think, you know, 
hey, someone's walking up to me and they're scary to me. Now you're about to have a uh, gun interaction or violent altercation with someone who thinks they're just trying to make sure that the homeowner, you, are actually you. You see them as a threat coming towards you and now you have an altercation. This happens every day. Our training system emphasizes psychology so that these kinds of altercations are avoidable. So you're not shooting unarmed kids. So you're not getting killed by kids. So people aren't killing people and, and, and doing things they, they meant to do a different way, but it turned out to be the wrong way. And so in order to avoid false positives, in order to avoid false outcomes, negative outcomes, we have to have a system for that. And that's what threat management is. And the way that, that we can teach this now is because we have years of experience at uh, making the system right. So years of failure to then create a better way of thinking. So when I first started on the east side of Detroit, my objective was to teach people to defend themselves. And then I found out that <clears throat> what they needed was actual intervention. Someone would have to come help the people. And at first, I thought it was going to be the police, so I would call them a lot. And I would try to confirm, you know, try to try to convey it to them, like, hey, police, here's the situation. And I would try to get the witnesses together, you know, here's what happened, here's the violence, and here's the victims, and get all the information from police. And then I just found out the police and uh, I were not seeing things similar. Uh, I thought that police should uh, protect the people and prosecute bad guys and things like that. The police thought I was, um, trying to do something they were not interested in. They were not interested in prevention of anything. They were there to prosecute primarily for drugs. So that was their function, that was their purpose. Or if they don't like someone, or like something, or they have different reasons. But I'm interfering because I'm trying to get them to do these other things. Um, in one case, a guy was shooting a fully automatic rifle out of a window uh, into a <coughs> abandoned structure next to him. And this is one of those times we hear these stories of you know, all of them were shooting a gun in the city and they shot somebody by accident or shot some people randomly. Well, you can avoid these situations by simply going over there. What I did was I uh, called the police a lot, so much so they knew my name. I would call and they would say, oh, is this Dale? Dale, you calling again? I was like, yeah, it's me. Uh, still, the guy's still shooting again. The reason why this guy was shooting every day at 4 o'clock was that was shift change for police department, so there's no police to respond for at least an hour. And he knows that. It turns out everyone knew that but me. So there's all kinds of mayhem from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock every day. And they know my I call every day at 4 to 5. They're like, Dale, no, you can stop now. And so finally, finally uh, it was a, a special day. Um, it was uh, 4th of July, and the guy was shooting full auto all day. <laughs> so every time he shot a magazine, I would just get a little closer, a little closer. And so I finally found the house he was shooting out of. I saw a muzzle flash coming out of the side of his house. And I was like, great, now I'm gonna go tell the police and we'll get, they can go over here and do what police do to stop gunmen, right? You know, that's gunmen, it's bad, so they're supposed to stop the gunmen. So that's what I thought, right? I watched television, so this is great. They don't have to do like research or anything. No drone, no nothing, they can just listen to me, I got the address, we're good to go. They were like, uh, so you're reporting a house, a guy was shooting, and what do you want us to do about it? I was like, oh, I was thinking, go over there and police them, or whatever it is you guys do. It can't be right. Well, he's not shooting right now, is he? I don't know. I'm here with you. I don't know if he's shooting right now. He probably is. So they're like, oh, well, then they gave me the, they, they, I call it the Brian Gumble. My voice throws him off. So they're like, he might be someone important. He might be a federal agent or something. So we can't just tell him to get out. So they, say, they would say to me, like, okay, well, uh, we'll look into that, sir. Uh, we'll send some right over on that. And I was like, well, you do that. I'll be down there. They're like, you wait for us. Like, well, I will. So I go back to the neighborhood. I'm like, this is great. Cops are on the way. So I see this car full of cops. I'm like, oh, there must be a special task force. So I go over there. Three of them are uh, undercover. They're, uh, they're in a position like this. They're acting like they're sleeping. I think it's to trick the um, criminals. Um, so they, they will think they're sleeping. So um, I thought they were you know, like undercover mission in the back seat there. So the one that was awake, he was like, yeah, how can I help you? I was like, uh, yes, sir. I'm the guy who called about the gunfire. They were like, gunfire. I was like, yeah, gunfire. He was like, what are you talking about? I said, right down here, gunfire? He was like, you know, just, just show me what you're talking about. He tried to play it off. And that's when I was like, they're not here for that. And those guys aren't fake sleeping. <laughs> they're not undercover. They're actually sleeping and right, right in front of everyone. So he follows me down there. He goes, show me the house. So I go down this, by this house. 
I'm so excited. I'm like, yes, we're gonna get safety for the families. So I pull up to the house, put the spotlight on the house, and the police car drives right past me. And then I turn the light off, and I drive away. <laughs> I'm just hoping he doesn't start shooting out the window right now, right? And so the cop car pulls down the street. We go down there, I say, uh, yes, sir. I was in front of the house. I put the light on the house. He goes, see, so it's out. He goes, Mr. Brown, I'm looking at your car here, and it says survival instructor. He said, um, now, you said there's a man with a rifle and they're shooting a gun. Does it look like, does that sound like something that's survival oriented? To put a spotlight on a house with a gunman shooting out of it? <laughs> I said, no, that's a very good point. I said, but the survival instructor is for teaching other people to survive. I'm here to protect. I'm not here to survive so the children can die. So that's the difference. I understand your point. You're trying to, you guys are, your number one priority is to get home to your family at night. And I can, I can sort of respect that and you're away. But in my world, I protect people. So my job is to keep these families alive, and I would rather die than know that I'm alive while kids got killed sitting in their home. And he was like, that's just weird. You're, you're very odd. We'll look into this when we get ready. And he takes off, right? Now, from the, what's interesting is that guy, I told you, shot that gun every day, right? A year goes by, and some guy starts walking towards me. Now, at this time, I'm gun dependent, so I think, I don't know, Someone's coming towards me, I get my, so I'm in my position, I'm ready to draw down, I'm getting close, he's coming close, I go like this, and this huge guy goes, don't you ever come to my house again! I was like, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, what house? He goes, I saw you shine a light on my house. I was like, shine a light on your, you mean like a year ago? A year ago? You're mad about a year ago? I have not shined a light on a house in over a year. This guy remembers that day and he never shot his gun another time. Not once did he ever shoot. So imagine the families, the kids could sleep in this community where no one shot this full automatic rifle and all I had to do was shine a light on the house. No raid, no takedown, uh, no warrant, no no-knock warrant. All I had to do was shine a light on the house. I couldn't believe it was that easy. What I wanted to do was help the family.